to the Explorers. Time traveling through history, one era at a time. I'm Kate Armstrong. On our journey through ancient Rome, we've walked mostly with imperial women, seeing the Republic, then the Empire through their eyes. Those ladies lived at the center of Rome's politics and aristocracy, very much players at the heart of the game. But what was life like for women in the territories it conquered? At its height in 117 CE, Rome controlled everything from the misty fields of Britannia to the northern rim of Africa east all the way through Europe and north to Armenia. Their territory stretched over 5 million square kilometers. The Roman military machine that took hold of these lands was legend. Efficient, brutal, unstoppable. When people saw it coming, they had a stark choice to make. Fight back and risk losing everything, or give in and live to fight another day. Over time, some folded themselves into the empire, choosing to work with rather than against it. But there were always those who fought back against the empire that sought to change and to rule them. These rebels with a cause gave everything they had for freedom. A few of them even happened to be women. And sometimes, just sometimes, they fought and won against Rome, striking fear into the hearts of men. We're about to go on an adventure with two of them, Boudica and Zenobia. These warrior women were from different times and vastly different cultures. One was bent on revenge against the soldiers who hurt her family. The other was a cosmopolitan ruler who took advantage of Rome's weaknesses to take a huge chunk of the empire for herself. They're both like candle flames seen through a thick, wind-ruffled sheet. The details are hazy, shrouded in mystery and hearsay, leaving only a glowing impression of greatness. We know more about what these legends came to stand for than who they truly were. Our sources for their lives are scant, always biased, and often dubious. But their tales are just too delicious not to tell. History is a story, after all, forever shaped by the storyteller. And so, I'll do my best to drop us into their worlds to experience the feats they achieved against all odds. Grab a pointy spear, some riding boots, and a steely will. Let's go traveling. But first, a shout out to some of my patrons. My newest pirate queens, Leia, Joby, Barbara, Tona, Kayleen, and Jenny. My newest lady presidents, Heika, Mariana, Amanda G, and Ellen. My boss ladies, Grace, Annie, Bethany, Bronwyn, Eva, Melissa, Nulia, and Rebecca. My adventuresses, Amber, Stephanie C, Alexis, Kira, Iris, Jessica R, Jessica S, Kelly, Lizzie, Samantha, and Karen C. My warrior queens, Avery, and my BFF, Lori, and my exalted Lady Pharaoh, Courtney. Becoming a patron really helps me keep the show going and gives you access to exclusive bonus content, interviews, sneak peeks, early releases, and more. To find out more about it, just go to my website. And now, on with the show. A woman grips her spear as flames dance in the distance. All around her, a city burns. It's a Roman city, a symbol of everything she wants to tear down and banish from her homeland. Her husband tried to play nice with the Romans, to share their lands and find some kind of peace. But when he died, they marched into her village, savaged her people, assaulted her daughters, and beat her until she was covered in blood. Screams sound in the distance, but she has no room in her heart left for mercy. Her people, her rage, demands retribution. Burn it, she whispers. Burn it all. Like so many of our most legendary women warriors, Boudicca's been known by many names. Boudica with one C and two, Bodicea, Budug in Welsh. We don't even know if that's the name she was born with. 
We think it derives from a proto-Celtic word that means victorious, which could be a title she picks up later. Either way, it fits her well. By all accounts, this queen of Britannia's Iceni is like a raging wildfire, giving the Romans in her lands quite a serious run for their money. How does she end up at the head of a ragtag army that burns several of their cities to the ground? It's 60 CE when Boudicca revolts against the Roman Empire. But to understand what exactly she's fighting, we have to travel a bit further back. By the time Boudicca's picking up her pointiest spear, Rome's only occupied the islands that they call Britannia for about two decades. But they'd known about the wild, mysterious islands over the ocean for quite a long time. A Greek explorer, Pythias of Massilia, circumnavigated this cluster of islands around 330 BCE and wrote about his travels. He dubbed them the Pretanic Isles, and some of the people he discovered there the Pretani. It's related, we think, to a Celtic word that might mean the people who paint themselves. Julius Caesar will later misspell it, which is why we're going to call it Britannia. <laughs> Julius Caesar is the first Roman general to officially sashay over the channel into this mysterious land. In August of 55 BCE, he sails off to see what he can see. Just to ground you in what we've already learned about Caesar, at this point he's still part of the first triumvirate. He's well into his on-again, off-again affair with our friend Servilia. And he hasn't yet had his lusty tryst with Cleopatra. Remember that, at this point, Rome is still a republic, not yet the vast empire it will become. Soldiers feel more allegiance to their generals than anyone, and they'll usually follow him wherever he leads. Julius is a man on the rise, and he knows that conquering foreign lands is a potent way of gaining fame and influence. In fact, he's just won a rather bloody, and from his perspective, successful, campaign over in Gaul. Gaul is worth lingering over for a minute, because culturally, its people bear a striking resemblance to the one we'll find in Britannia. Proud, clannish, fearsome in battle, and loath to let anyone tell them what to do. Gaul encompasses a huge swath of land that sprawls across Western Europe, including France, Luxembourg, Belgium, Switzerland, some of the Netherlands, bits of Germany, and bits of Northern Italy, too. This is a good time to define the term Celt as well, though it turns out it's not an easy one to pin down. The ancients used it to describe a whole host of European peoples whose languages, cultures, and political structures all shared a common origin. It first appeared in the Late Bronze Age around the Upper Danube around the 13th century BCE. From there, it spread through Europe and eventually into the British Isles. To the Romans, all Celts seem pretty much the same, but each has their own traditions and local way of doing things. None of these clans see themselves as a united Celtic whole, or even as united by any kind of nationhood. But one thing they most definitely share is a reputation as some of the most fearsome warriors around. The Gauls, in particular, sacked Rome in 390 BCE, then again in 279 and 225. Roman sources describe how they embalm the severed heads of their enemies and have their horses wear them like a gruesome necklace. And we have some archaeological evidence to suggest that story's true. Their long hair, imposing physiques, big swords, and nimble chariots have long inspired fear in the hearts of Roman generals. You know what else makes them quake in their togas? The women who ride into battle beside them. As one ancient Roman historian will comment, A whole band of foreigners will be unable to cope with one of them in a fight, if he call in his wife. The Gauls have no desire to see the Romans take over what's rightfully theirs, but their tendency to fight with and turn on each other gives Caesar the upper hand. For lots of fascinating stuff about Caesar and the Gauls and Celtic culture in general, go and listen to some episodes of Ancient History Fangirl. For now, just know that conquering the Gauls is considered an incredibly gigantic deal for Caesar. High on victory, Julius decides to keep on heading north. He sends a Gaulish ally across the channel to try and drum up support amongst the local tribes in Britannia, and another on a fast galley to scout out the coast. When the time is right, he assembles 80 ships and some 12,000 men, and heads for the White Cliffs of Dover. What he finds there is a bunch of warriors staring down at him, armed to the teeth and looking ready to rumble. Undaunted, Julius sails up the coast, looking for a good place to land, while the locals keep pace beside them. 
With so many trade relations with Gaul, it's possible the Britannians have a good idea what's coming for them, and they have zero interest in a Roman general stopping by. The Roman army is one of the most disciplined and organized around, and these particular troops have just celebrated some unexpected victories against people very much like the ones up on those cliffs. And yet, when they're given the order to disembark somewhere near Kent, the legions hesitate. Who can blame them as they face down a bunch of screaming warriors with blue-painted skin and cruel-looking spears, horses and chariots glinting? Britannia is a place of myth and mystery they aren't sure they really want to explore. For the Romans, Britannia has long been a land of scary stories, repeated around fires late into the night. Years later, Agrippina the Elder's husband Germanicus will accidentally wash up on the shores of Britannia. Of what they find there, Tacitus tells us, Not a man returned from the distance without his tale of wonders, violent whirlwinds, mysterious birds, Enigmatic shapes, half man, half beast, things seen and things believed in a moment of terror. But after getting a stern talking to, Julius's troops disembark and get into a very messy skirmish. They eventually drive the Britons back, but with their cavalry still at sea, Caesar can't do much to follow up the action. It turns into an unfortunate trip all around. Starvation, storms, shipwrecks. Tired of the whole business, or perhaps just defeated by it, Caesar sails back to Gaul. His second trip the following year goes better. A powerful tribe named the Trinovantes offer him aid and provisions, and five further tribes surrender to him. But others won't give up what's theirs without a fight. When Caesar sails back to Gaul this time, he's secured some promises of hostages and tribute, but he doesn't leave anything like a permanent mark. But his trip creates a link between Britannia and Rome, which will continue to grow through trade relations. Rome won't forget about the wild land to the north. The Romans won't march into Britannia again for another hundred years or so, so let's stop and meet the Celts of Britain properly. We're talking about Britain at the tail end of what historians call the Iron Age. Like over in Gaul, the Britannic Isles are home to lots of different tribes, all with their own leaders, laws, territories, and allegiances. It's not at all uncommon for them to fight with each other. Britannia isn't always a peaceful place to be. Like proper colonialists, our Roman sources would have us believe that they bring culture and civilization to the Brits, but of course that's not true. Archaeological finds suggest they built their own cities, and while they don't have tall buildings like the Romans, that doesn't mean they are constructing impressive things. A lot of these buildings will be lost to time, but their foundations remain for us to look at. In Scotland, there are the tall, double-walled stone towers called brocks. British tribes build some impressive hill forts. And then there's Stonehenge in southern England, constructed well before the Iron Age. Theories abound on what exactly the site was built for, but one thing is clear. The massive bluestones brought there around 2500 BCE were carted all the way from Wales, through lands held by different tribes and situated in a beautiful and very specific way. The Romans might not be impressed, but I sure am. Literacy among Iron Age Brits doesn't seem widespread. They don't write down their stories, but that's not the only form of complex storytelling. We found sophisticated weaponry, wheels, art, and surgical tools like scalpels and forceps. And jewelry, such glorious jewelry. One type is called a torque, a hollow metal circlet that's open at both ends so it can be fitted around someone's throat like a choker. Made of gold and sometimes silver, these are as beautiful and sophisticated as any metalwork found in Rome. I'll post some pictures in the show notes so you can see them for yourself. Most people are farmers who spend their days plowing, herding, weaving, spinning, cooking, butchering. They live in roundhouses where a fire in a central hearth is always burning, made from timber and thatch. They trade with other Celtic people in continental Europe, and as trade brings more money, some people start putting down scythes and picking up spears instead. They show off their wealth on elaborate shields and wear it on their bodies. Warrior leaders start turning into monarchal dynasties, and that gives women a chance at power, too. 
After Caesar dies and Augustus becomes Rome's first emperor, he doesn't have time to bother with Britannia. There's way too much Rome-centric drama to smooth out. Several British kings show up in Rome starting during his reign, seeking refuge and perhaps hoping the empire might intervene in their affairs back home. This reminds me a little of the Ptolemaic royals over in Egypt, asking Rome to get involved in their political dramas. Big mistake. Then Gaius, aka Caligula, sends some of his troops across the channel in 40 CE. He talks a big game about wanting to conquer the islands, but when he gets close, he seems to change his mind. He orders his confused troops to collect some seashells as if they're war trophies, calling them, as Suetonius tells us, The spoils of the sea. Oh, Caligula. And then comes our old friend, Emperor Claudius, who, as you'll remember, will become Agrippina the Younger's husband. He is the fourth emperor in what is now very firmly an empire, one keen to expand its borders and its power. He needs a big PR win to establish his authority, and what better way to get it than to conquer the land even the great Caesar couldn't? It would gain them valuable metals, pearls, and, of course, slaves, with the added bonus of helping them subdue those pesky Gauls, who keep using Britannia as a mutinous home base for their rebellions. So he sends an expedition over, which connects with two tribes, the Cantiasi and the Caduvalani. If they become Roman allies, they say, Claudius will make it worth their while. Later, when one of Claudius's client kings, a guy named Verica, is ousted from his tribe and territory, Claudius uses it as an excuse to send four legions over. You know, just to help out his buddy. Not to take over an island. Oh no. When some 40,000 Roman soldiers sail over and make their way inland, they're met by two kings, Caraticus and Togodumnus. We can only imagine their feelings as they watch those legions march across their land. Their forces clash at what's now called the Battle of the Medway. The fighting goes on for days, bloody and brutal on both sides. Eventually, Togodumnus is slain, Caraticus flees, and the Brits have no choice but to bend the knee to the Romans. Claudius shows up in his fanciest gear just in time to see his troops capture the town of Camulodunum. That's where a number of local kings surrender to him. Plautius, Claudius's commander, is set up as the local governor. And with that, Rome has officially dug its claws into Britannia. Not to say there won't be more rebellions. Caraticus, that king who managed to escape at the Medway, takes his bruised pride and burning fury over to the Welsh mountains, where he builds up a force to fight back. In 47 CE, he starts wreaking havoc on the Romans, so much so that when a new governor shows up in 48, he immediately sets up to fight him down. As part of that move, he takes all weapons away from the tribes that have allied with Rome, you know, as an extra precaution. Unsurprisingly, it stirs up some serious local ire. We're supposed to be friends, remember? Some of these tribes band together to revolt against this new governor and his forces, including some members of the Iceni. That's Boudicca's tribe, but more on that in a moment. Eventually, Caraticus is cornered and flees north into the lands held by the Brigantes. He hopes they will hide him and maybe even join him. But their ruler is not about to jeopardize her good relationship with the Empire, so she claps him in irons and sends him off to Rome. Wait, did I just say she? Another queen? Yes, the first one documented in Britannia. Her name is Cardamandua. Don't get too excited, as we know even less about her than we do about Boudicca. What we know is that she's queen of the Brigantes, in control of one of Britannia's largest territories. And she stays in power for decades, despite how Rome feels about females in charge. Powerful women clearly aren't a foreign concept in Britannia. The Brigantes get their name from a patron goddess, Brigantia. Rome might not think women can rule, but the tribes here disagree. Most of what we know about her comes from Tacitus, who paints her as, you guessed it, little better than a lust-driven shrew. Over the coming years, the story goes, Cardamandua will cheat on her husband, Venusius, cuckolding him in favor of his armor-bearer. So, of course, Tacitus tells us, she doesn't have many friends. On the side of the husband were the affections of the people, on that of the adulterer, the lust and savage temper of the queen. 
Cardamandua asks for some Roman troops to protect her from her husband, which they send. Eventually, they'll end up divorced and in a very bloody feud, during which Tacitus says she uses cunning stratagems to capture her ex-husband's family members. This would all be fine if a man was doing it. But, as Tacitus makes sure to point out, the people around Cardamandua were stung with shame at the prospect of falling under the dominion of a woman. We've heard this before in tales told of warrior queens, and we're going to keep hearing it. How shameful everyone finds it to be led by a lady. But to me, this sounds a whole lot like Roman anxiety about women in positions of power. Roman nail-biting over female leadership aside, it's clear Cardamandua is a savvy ruler. We can't know why she turns Caraticus in, but she must see it as a way to hold on to her authority, even if Roman writers don't give her much respect. Back to the freedom fighter Caraticus. It's 51 CE now, and he's famous enough for his exploits that he and his family are sent to Rome in chains. They're paraded through the streets, then brought to beg for their lives at Claudius's dais. You might remember that Agrippina the Younger is also here for this very public, very political moment, and sitting on her own impressive dais. When Caraticus is given the floor, he makes quite a speech. Here's a highlight. If you Romans choose to lord it over the world, does it follow that the world is to accept slavery? Were I to have been at once delivered up as a prisoner, neither my fall nor your triumph would have become famous. My punishment would be followed by oblivion, whereas, if you save my life, I shall be an everlasting memorial of your clemency. It's so impressive that he and his family are given their freedom. And, as Tacitus has it, after they are released from their bonds, they did homage also to Agrippina, who sat near, conspicuous on another throne, in the same language of praise and gratitude. You have to wonder if Agrippina knows about the woman who helped send this man onto his knees before her, and what she thinks of a queen ruling somewhere far across the waves. She's certainly never heard the name Boudica. Aggie will die just a year before she becomes a famous and fearsome warrior queen. As we meet up with Boudica at last, it's important to note that we get her story from only two historians, Tacitus and Cassius Dio. And both are, well, Roman men, so biased against a woman they see as a barbarian and the enemy of their empire. Tacitus is alive during her lifetime, at least, and his father-in-law is actually in Britain during her revolt. He probably had access to people who know what happened. Cassius Dio, not so much. Their accounts are different in several respects, and it's impossible to take either one of them as gospel. But we'll do our best to muddle through. Born somewhere around 30 CE, Boudicca's a teen when Rome moves into her homeland. She grows up amongst the Iceni in Britannia's southeast in a time of immense change. One where there are two kinds of people, those who ally with the Romans and those who rebel against them. On the one hand, becoming a Roman client ruler is to enter into a relationship with a clear imbalance of power. But on the other, it holds Rome at arm's length, slowing their land's absorption into the empire and allowing them some breathing room, at least in theory. Those who play nice don't have a totally raw deal. Client kingdoms have to pay taxes, of course, and offer support to the Romans when needed, but it also wins them protection and no direct military overlording. Very little at all changes in the lives of clans to the north. The roads get better, sure, but life is mostly what it was before. In the south, the Roman presence is much more prevalent, but it's not as if they are systematically wiping out all local culture. It's more like the tribes are viewing and interpreting Roman ways through their own particular filter and taking advantage of what Rome has to offer. There's alliance here, but also a simmering tension. There's dry tinder under everyone's feet, just waiting to flame into rebellion. All it's going to take is someone being careless with a match. From what we know, the Iceni are a relatively wealthy people. They've been minting coins for nearly a century. Tacitus tells us that Boudica is probably born into royalty, so she's probably one of Iceni's richer members and sees herself as someone born to rule. She's smart, too. Cassius Dio says, in one humdinger of a backhanded compliment, that she is possessed of greater intelligence than often belongs to women. 
The Iceni are ruled by a king named Prasutagus, who just so happens to be Boudicca's husband. Prasutagus is firmly a Roman ally. Remember earlier when some Iceni broke off and fought Roman occupation? Well, it doesn't seem that Prasutagus was involved. He might even become king after the fighting, precisely because he doesn't join in. It's hard to know how far his loyalty to, and trust in, the Roman occupiers extends. But it's clear that he works hard to walk the line between being true to his people and keeping Rome happy. Boudicca and her two daughters likely see Rome as their friend, or at least their frenemy. But then Prasutagus dies, and in his will, as in his life, he tries to keep everyone happy. He leaves half of his kingdom to the current emperor, Nero. I'm the king of the world! Shut up, Nero. But he leaves the other half to his daughters, with Boudicca to serve as regent until her daughters are old enough to rule. Prasutagus has been a good client king. Surely Rome will honor his wishes. But it turns out that they plan to do no such thing. Under Roman law, when a client king dies, his lands automatically go to the empire. And they aren't about to let a couple of women rule what's theirs. Cadus Decianus, Rome's procurator in Britannia, is tasked with taking Prasutagus's land. But he does much more than that. He sends soldiers into their settlement to take his personal wealth as well. And so much more. Imagine it. Boudicca looking up at the sound of boots and hoofbeats, dread filling her heart when she hears the first screams. Tacitus says that all Prasutagus owns, all Boudicca owns, is being plundered by centurions, his house by slaves, as if they were the spoils of war. And then they tie Boudicca up, right there for all to see, and whip her bloody. Between one painful lash and the next, she sees soldiers drag off her daughters, taken by the men who were supposed to be their allies, and she can do nothing but watch, helpless in her rage. Atrocities performed, the Romans leave, believing Boudicca bowed, bent, and broken, but they've lit a fire in her that nothing but their blood can put out. Before long, she's rallied the Iceni, readying them to go to war. The neighboring Trinovantes show up too. More and more people come to her side, sick of Rome's tyranny, rallying around her. And at no point in this gathering of like-minded people does it seem that a man steps up to try to take the spotlight, as if they know that Boudicca's the one to unite and focus them all. And then she steps in front of some 120,000 people. Looking out into the seething crowd, she makes her case for war. We don't know what she actually says in this moment, but Cassius Dio attributes to her these stirring words. Although some of you may previously, through ignorance of which was better, have been deceived by the alluring promises of the Romans, you have learned how great a mistake you made in preferring an imported despotism to your ancestral mode of life. And you have come to realize how much better is poverty with no master than wealth with slavery. Let us, I say, do our duty while we still remember what freedom is, that we may leave to our children not only its appellation, but also its reality. For if we utterly forget the happy state in which we were born and bred, what prey will they do, reared in bondage? We only have one description of what Boudicca looks like, also from Cassius Dio, so suspect, but he does give us an awe-inspiring sight. In stature she was very tall, in appearance most terrifying, in the glance of her eye most fierce, and her voice was harsh. She wears a tunic and a cape held in place by a brooch, as well as a golden torque around her neck, a symbol of power. A great mass of red hair tumbles down to her hips. She grasped a spear, Dio says, to aid in terrifying all beholders. As a factual representation, this description should be given some serious side eye. But it's a wonderful image. This woman, proud and strong and fearsome, stirring tens of thousands to avenge the wrongs done against them, to fight for independence at all costs. 
Cassie Dio says that she asks the gods whether or not their cause is righteous, loosing a hair from the folds of her dress to see which way it runs. We can imagine Boudicca waiting, breath held, to see which direction it hops in. A cheer goes up. The gods are with them. It's time to climb onto her chariot and ride. She and her daughters lead her rebel band down to Camula Dunham. It's a potent symbolic choice. This is where Claudius accepted the surrender of British kings back in 43. It started out as Rome's main military base, but it's since been turned into a colony full of Roman military families. A massive temple was built there to honor the now-deceased Claudius, a gilded testament to his conquest, and Boudicca's about to burn it to the ground. The town has no defensive wall, no ditches, no fences. The veterans who live here are mostly old, and there's barely any real military force. The Roman governor of Britannia is on the other side of the island, putting down an uprising on the island of Mona, so he can't help. A few terrified colonists run to Catus Decianus. He sends 200 soldiers to help them, but 200 men against 120,000? You can imagine how that's going to turn out. The Ninth Legion also catches wind and heads to Camula Dunham, but they can't stop Boudicca's forces. The colonists can do little but hide in the temple and hope that Boudicca will give up and leave them. Sadly for them, she isn't the type to throw in the towel. Over a two-day siege, the temple is destroyed and all those within it. Even Claudius's bronze head is decapitated, such is the force of her ire. Unguarded and unprepared, Tacitus tells us, they were taken by surprise. The colony was laid waste with fire and sword. Across all the cities Boudicca attacks, archaeologists will find a thick layer of ash from this period. Some call it the Boudican layer. Full of molten glass, burned coins, broken roof tiles, and charred bits of pottery, it's a mark so profound that thousands of years won't be able to wash it away. This isn't just retaliation, it's a reckoning. Hell hath no fury, like a woman scorned. From there, they march southwest, towards Londinium. It's one of Rome's most important urban centers in Britannia, which makes it a prime target for Boudicca's wrath. Hearing about Camula Dunham, Governor Gaius Suetonius Paulinus races over, hoping to stop her in her tracks. But when he learns how huge her forces are, he decides that maybe this isn't the right time to strike. And so they leave the city of 9,000 Romans to Boudicca, and she isn't one for mercy. Most of the citizens flee. Those who won't or can't are killed. The city burned. And still she keeps going, arriving in nearby Verulamium. This isn't a Roman settlement, but one built by locals, with Roman support. If you aren't with the revolt, then you're against it. You've made your bed as far as Boudicca's concerned. Tacitus tells us that some 70,000 people are killed at Londinium and Verulamium. Cassius Dio describes in grisly detail how Boudicca's forces take their revenge. They hung up naked, the noblest and most distinguished women, and then cut off their breasts and sewed them to their mouths in order to make the victims appear to be eating them. Afterwards, they impaled the women on sharp skewers, run lengthwise through the entire body, it's a horrible echo of the rape Boudicca's daughters endured. They do this while feasting, apparently, and engaging in all sorts of wanton behavior. Again, I find this whole accounting deeply suspect, but it's possible. War in the ancient world's an ugly thing. Gaius Suetonius Paulinus knows he's got to get a handle on this situation, so he picks a valley backed by woodlands as the place he'll meet Boudicca with a force of around 10,000 men. We don't know exactly where this valley is, but it's somewhere in the Midlands, along a Roman road known as Watling Street. Boudicca's forces pull up and make camp. They must be quite a sight in all their multitude, and they're confident enough of their victory that they've brought their wives and families along, pulling their wagons into a semicircle so they can watch the action. Butter that popcorn, we'll be right back. The night before the battle, Boudicca rides her chariot along the lines, offering them a stirring speech. Again, we don't know what she actually says, but Tacitus gives us something to chew on. It is not as a woman descended from noble ancestry, but as one of the people that I am avenging lost freedom, my scourged body, the outraged chastity of my daughters, 
On this spot, we must either conquer or die with glory. There is no alternative. This is a woman's resolve. The men, if they please, may live and be slaves. And so the battle begins. Organized into their tribes, the British rush up to the Roman forces. They have swords meant for close fighting, but most have little armor, and nothing to make a dent in their enemy from a distance. The Romans throw their spears, holding them back. Boudica has the numbers, but her forces aren't trained warriors. At least, not trained in the same way as the Roman legions. And until now, they haven't had to face a Roman army head-on. When they've exhausted themselves against the Roman front lines, that's when the legions move in. They push back Boudica's force right into the circle of wagons, trapped with nowhere left to run. We can imagine Boudica's dawning realization. She's going to lose this battle, and there will be no reprieve. Perhaps she looks to her daughters or to the heavens. Perhaps she only curses the Romans and fights for all she's worth. The Romans kill everyone. Rebels, wifely spectators, children, even their pack animals. Apparently, some 80,000 Britons are killed. And Boudica? We don't know what happens to her or her daughters. Perhaps she rushes into the fighting and meets the same fate as the rest. Tacitus suggests she poisons herself, as Cleopatra did, to avoid capture. Cassius Dio says she falls ill and dies. Perhaps to lose was always her destiny. She couldn't stop the Empire from taking over her world. But before she left it, Boudica struck true fear into the hearts of the Romans. She fought back against them, and for a while, she won. Her remains have never been found, but her name has lingered on the air ever after. When Tacitus' writings are uncovered in the 16th century, she'll be regarded as a queen and savior, compared to reigning queen Elizabeth I. She's remained a potent symbol of independence and fierceness, a woman who refuses to be cowed. A woman steps out onto a rooftop, looking down at thousands of soldiers arrayed on the sand. Some are hers, a force her husband built and that she harnessed to build herself an empire. Her own will and cunning have made her Augusta of the Eastern Roman world. But now they face down the infamous Roman army, the might of 70,000 soldiers and an emperor who wants to take what she has won away. It will be an ugly fight, she knows, but this battle is everything. It will decide the fate of her empire, her son, and herself. Zenobia raises her arm and watches two armies throw themselves at each other. This queen of the desert knows it's a gamble, but she won't lose her diadem without a fight. Zenobia doesn't rebel against the Empire for revenge or for freedom. She does it because she wants to rule. And she pulls off what many hardened warriors tried and failed to. She conquers a third of the Roman Empire. What brings her to this place and to this battle? How does she become a warrior queen risking it all? To learn that, we have to touch down in her home city of Palmyra. Perched at the edge of the Syrian desert, about 130 miles northeast of modern-day Damascus, this palm-fringed oasis is the gateway between the Roman and the Persian empires. And it's a key stop along a major caravan route, an economic link between west and east. It's a unique and self-contained city, like ancient Athens, a kind of city-state power unto itself. Trade is at the center of life here. Money and goods flow into this place from east and west every day. You can see it everywhere you look, bronze statues glinting in the sun, rich tapestries hanging from windows, in the Roman-style buildings and baths, and the fountains full of gushing water brought up from underground pipes. This isn't a dusty frontier town. 
Called the Pearl of the Desert, it's well known for its magnificence, and there's plenty of diversity here as well. You'll see people from all over mixing and mingling along the colonnade that runs through the city, selling and buying their wares. You'll see Greco-Roman touches, as Palmyra is always at the height of what's fashionable, but also plenty of Arabic influence. Greek is spoken by the wealthy, but so is Aramaic. The Temple of Bel might look like a Roman temple, but the god worshipped inside is not part of that pantheon. The temple itself, on closer inspection, is also unique to Palmyra, with windows like a private house and a terrace that people sit out and feast on. Like over in ancient Egypt, the god actually lives inside. You'll see Greek and Roman dress here, but also outfits that no one in Rome would ever wear. Men don clothes that are stitched, not pinned, including wide pants like the Persians wear. Noble merchants wear daggers at their hips, despite the fact that such a thing is prohibited elsewhere in the empire. Women wear tunics and cloaks that only cover their hair, not their faces. Some of them even wear billowing pantaloons. Oh my. Palmyra has been a Roman province since Tiberius's time, and it seems as if the Palmyrenes are pretty fine with that. This is not a people trying to shake off the yoke of their Roman oppressors. In some ways, they see themselves as Roman as well. Decades ago, changes in Roman law made it so that Palmyrenes are considered citizens of the empire. Zenobia will grow up seeing herself as one of them. They build an agora and an amphitheater. They worship at the imperial cult. They adopt Roman names like Julia, in honor of Empress Julia Damna, who died a few decades before Zenobia is born but they're also proud of their culture, religion, language, and nomadic roots. And don't forget, Palmyra's quite far away from Rome proper. That distance, and its economic importance, has helped the city gain a liberal amount of autonomy. They run their own affairs, and in their own way. There are certain expectations for Roman citizens, of course. The Palmyrenes will pay taxes and abide by the empire's rules. But there isn't much of a military presence in terms of Roman legions. It's governed by a civic council that consists of tribal elites, usually from Palmyra's most distinguished families. They pass laws and manage their own troops. Their bow and arrow wielding cavalry is supposed to fight on the Empire's behalf, but mostly they protect the city from any who might try to invade it. And so they gain experience, both as fighters and commanders. The Romans might just come to regret this later. The people with the power in Palmyra are the ones who manage the caravan trade. Because this isn't just a stop along the Silk Road. It's home to the people who help traders navigate the desert, providing protection from local raiders and knowledge in local languages and customs. To control such operations takes a head for business, an emissary's cunning, and a splash of a warlord's strength. Such merchant magnates have influence, political and economic, and can raise a fighting force without breaking a sweat. Now let's turn our gazes to Zenobia. Born around 240, we know very little with certainty about the woman herself. Much of what we know comes from a handful of sources. Greek historian Zosimus, Byzantine scholar Zonaris, and Arab historian Al-Tabari, all of whom live centuries after Zenobia's time. There's also the Historia Augusta, a collection of Roman biographies that we now know is a pretty sketchy source. It tells us that Zenobia will claim to be a descendant of Cleopatra. A fabulous notion, to be sure, but pretty unlikely. What do you think, Zenobia? Let's agree to disagree. It's more likely that she's of Arab descent, born and raised as part of a rich and influential Palmyrene family. We don't know much about her childhood, but we get a sense that she gets a good education, which makes sense for a wealthy girl in this cosmopolitan place. 18th century British historian Edward Gibbon, working from Roman sources, tells us, Zenobia is perhaps the only female whose superior genius broke through the servile indolence imposed on her sex. Her manly understanding was strengthened and adorned by study. Thanks, I guess? She's great at languages, Edward tells us. Aramaic, Greek, Egyptian, and even some Latin. Like Cleopatra, she grows up knowing how to command a room and knows that leading is easier if you speak in many tongues. Al-Tabari says that at an early age, she's put in charge of some flocks and some shepherds, which teaches her how to rule over men. 
He also says she grows up riding horses. And camels, of course, which is a fun fact we'll return to later. Al-Tabari paints a picture of a leader famous for her toughness and stamina. She'll march with her troops over long distances, is a pro at wild game hunting, and can outdrink just about anyone around the late-night campfire. But she's not that mighty general quite yet. When she's still in her teens, Zenobia marries a man named Septimius Odinathus, and he's kind of a big deal. By the 250s, he's Palmyra's ruling dynast, given senatorial rank amongst the Romans. We're not exactly sure what his official role is in the local government, but he's clearly very important. Wealthy, distinguished, and poised to offer Zenobia a whole lot of influence. He's also a lot older than she is, but then this is the ancient world, so what else is new? Pretty much everything about their marriage, even the number of children they have, is up for debate. Is it a love match or an alliance between families? Probably the latter, given the huge disparity in their ages and their lofty positions. One fact that pops up a lot in the sources is Zenobia's strong stance on chastity. She believes that sex should only be for procreation, and she refuses to sleep with Odinathus except for the purposes of baby-making. Sucks for him. They have a son together, Wobbelot, and likely a few daughters, too. But he already has a son, Heyran, sometimes also called Herodes, from a previous marriage. He's probably the same age, or even older, than Zenobia. So that has the potential to be awkward. It's hard to know if Zenobia is treated as an equal in her husband's business dealings and political machinations, but given what a force she'll prove to be, and that when her husband goes out on campaign, she often joins him, I wouldn't be surprised to find he sees her as a partner in crime. Status for women is different in Palmyra than in Rome itself. They can own and manage property, and they can become legal guardians of both children and households. They can handle their own money and even get involved in government. She has every reason to believe that when she speaks, men will listen. It seems she's got a head for finance as well. Not one, but two sources from the ancient world say that she Preserved her treasure beyond the tendency for a woman And Exercised the judgment of a man Can't we just say how great she is without talking about how she doesn't have man parts? Anyway, it's clear that Zenobia's a woman on the rise. Meanwhile, over in Rome, the Empire isn't the cohesive powerhouse we saw under Livia and Augustus. It's not even the insular, backstabby situation we saw during Agrippina the Younger's time. No, this Rome's a disorganized hot mess. At this time, the Empire has gotten as big as it's ever going to get. So big, in fact, that it's become unwieldy. Rome's emperors are discovering that it's nearly impossible to control and manage a vast empire full of disparate and sometimes embittered peoples. Rebellions are cropping up left and right. And it turns out that trying to control the regions you've conquered is like playing a never-ending game of whack-a-mole. Since Boudicca's time, politics in Rome have gotten way more dysfunctional. No, really, even more dysfunctional. Guess how many emperors Rome has seen by the time Zenobia starts making a name for herself? Well, it depends whose list of emperors you look at, but let's call it more than ten. Rome has moved away from its dynastic families, where the emperor's seat is handed down from father to a sometimes blood-related and sometimes adopted son, to a period where that seat is often filled by conquest. Historians call these guys barracks emperors, men chosen by their troops, usually after they've assassinated whoever is currently ruling. A few years before Zenobia is born, Emperor Alexander Severus is assassinated by his own troops and replaced by another guy named Maximus Thrax. From there, it's a rotating door of emperors, some of whom hold on to power for so short a time that some historians don't even count them. Sometimes there's more than one emperor at a time. You know, just to confuse things. According to a list compiled by Pamela Toller, author of the wonderful book Women Warriors, Zenobia will see some 30 emperors in her lifetime. So, not exactly a beacon of stability and strength. We also see emperors start to arise not from Rome itself, but well outside it. Philip the Arab, who becomes emperor a few years after Zenobia is born, is from a city not all that far from Palmyra. So no wonder she'll one day look at the tire fire that is Rome and think she's better equipped to rule it. 
In 260 CE, the dysfunction reaches a whole new level when the Persians capture Emperor Valerian in battle. Some whisper that the Persian king, Shapur I, periodically uses him as a footstool for climbing up onto his noble steed. Valerian is held as a prisoner there until he dies. This is one of Rome's worst nightmares, and also a major PR embarrassment. Zenobia and her husband look at each other and wonder what they're bowing down to Rome for. They keep paying taxes, and what exactly are they getting for them? Nothing but an empire who keeps stirring up trouble with their neighbors, Parthia and Persia, messing with trade routes and compromising their economy. I imagine Zenobia and Odinathus staying up late into the night, just dreaming out loud about their futures. Wouldn't it be better if a strong, local power couple ran things in Palmyra? Now that is the best idea I've had all day. After defeating Valerian, the Persians turn their conquering sights on Palmyra, but Odinathus is ready. He breaks through the Persian lines and forces them to retreat. Before anyone quite knows what's happening, he's recaptured most of the Roman land the Persians took from them. This ambitious desert warlord has just made himself the ruler of the Roman East. One inscription from Palmyra calls him the King of Kings, and it seems as if everyone is ready to bow down to him. And why not? He seems a lot more fit to run things around here than any of those faraway Roman idiots. But Odinathus is quick to point out that everything he's doing is for Rome. He's like, you know, ruling, kind of, as their representative? No rebellion going on here. And given what a mess things are over in Rome proper, Valerian's son, the current Emperor Gallienus, can't do much but smile and nod along. In the interest of making this all look like it was his idea, Gallienus even gives Odonathus further powers, officially making him General of the East. Odonathus and his eldest son, Heran, are now running a huge swath of Roman territory, but we can assume that Zenobia has a huge part to play as well. The family spends this time creating a golden age in Palmyra, one that's safe and well-defended, but also highly cultured. Their circle is full of scholars and lively conversation. Things are looking pretty sweet in her world. But then, in 267, there's a violent shift within it. Odinathus and his eldest son die untimely and rather suspicious deaths. Who kills them and why? Some sources suggest that his nephew kills them after a fight following a group hunting trip. Others say Zenobia is in on the plot, but later historians have pretty much fully dismissed the idea. To me, it sounds like ancient male writers trotting out their favorite trope, the jealous, covetous wife. We heard this exact same tale about Olympias when her husband died. An ambitious, powerful woman is an easy one to blame. But there must be plenty of people around Odinathus who see how much power he's accrued and want him taken out of play. And like with Olympias, I don't see a lot of impetus for Zenobia to kill her husband. The stepson could be a problem for her own son, sure, but why kill dad when she knows it will upset the world they've built together? We don't know, but two things at least are clear. Odinathus has died under suspicious circumstances, and someone's about to step into his Persian-style heeled boots and rock them straight to greatness. Look out, world, because here I come. But to hold on to power, Zenobia will have to move swiftly. Her son, Walbalot, is too young to rule for now, so she pulls a Hatshepsut and has herself declared regent. She must be smart, persuasive, well-respected, and know how to command a room, because when she starts making moves, she does it with the army behind her. Her husband's main generals, Zabdas and Zabai, become her key advisors when she starts making power plays. She seizes control of more territories, then she rules them like a pro, fostering religious tolerance and cultivating peace. I mean, someone's got to. Meanwhile, over in Rome, Emperor Gallienus is murdered, the next guy dies of a so-called pestilence about 18 months later, and, well, they just don't have the bandwidth to worry about some queen out in the east. Besides, Zenobia is quick to make clear she isn't rebelling against Rome, oh no, 
Like her husband before her, she's simply ruling on behalf of Rome. But as time goes on, it's clear to everyone around her that Zenobia is running what looks increasingly like its very own empire. Encouraged by her advisors, she starts wondering what else she might achieve. Someone's got to run things on this side of the Mediterranean. I think it should be me. We don't know why she decides to go on the march to expand her territory further. Maybe she's trying to make sure Palmyra stays powerful and safe. Maybe she's done playing client queen and ready to become an empress herself. Regardless, while Rome is busy napping, she sends her forces all the way down to Egypt and seizes Alexandria, the same city that Octavian once ripped out of Cleopatra's hands. By 270 CE, Zenobia is taking control of the entire country, its grain, its wealth, all its riches. It's important to note that even this can be seen as a move made in Rome's best interest. Egypt's Roman governor is away at this time, fighting against an Egyptian rebel who's revolting against Rome's continued presence. Zenobia's troops are there to, you know, watch over Egypt for him. It's safe to say that Rome itself is unimpressed. But I'm doing it for my son, obviously. And my son is doing it for you, Rome. She says for the millionth time. It's not our fault you're always making a mess of things. Someone had to step in and tidy up. She must know she's walking a very fine line. She doesn't want to provoke Rome to gather their forces and attack her, but she also wants to get to a point where she can truly break free of their control. So she has coins minted with her son on one side and the new emperor Aurelian on the other, declaring them joint rulers of Egypt. She includes Aurelian's name on official correspondence, but she also conducts trade agreements and adds territories to her empire as it suits her. Zenobia gets to administrative work, entering into talks with the Levant and Asia Minor, adding them to her growing holdings. By 271, she controls much of modern-day Syria, Turkey, Jordan, and Egypt. Zenobia is in command of a third of the Roman Empire. Except it's now the Palmyrene Empire. She's pulled off a wild, ambitious gambit that few others have tried and none have achieved. High five, Zenobia! And still, Emperor Aurelian is so busy fighting the Goths and taking care of revolts closer to home that he continues to be distracted. But once things finally settle down at the end of 271, he gathers his troops and gets ready to march. Instead of backing down, Zenobia doubles down, having her and her son declared Augustus and Augusta. She's done pretending to be anything other than a ruler in her own right, and she's willing to fight for all she's won. Aurelian carves a path through Asia Minor, destroying any town declaring loyalty to Zenobia. Those who surrender are spared, and so more cities start throwing up their hands. Soon, there is very little between Zenobia's troops and a Roman army 70,000 strong. They turn and make a stand at Imae. When the Romans seem to be retreating, they think they have a chance, but then Aurelian's like, Psych! We're not retreating at all, suckers. And suddenly, they're facing a full-on assault. So Zenobia and her forces retreat to Antioch. This is the point at which some might contemplate giving in. But instead, Zenobia and one of her generals pull a fast one. They tell everyone that the Palmyrenes won the battle, dress a soldier up to look like Aurelian, and parade him through the streets to seal the ruse. Hooray! Once the victory party is in full swing, they slip quietly away to nearby Emesa. But Aurelian's legions aren't fooled, and they aren't far behind. Zenobia calls in what's left of her army and anyone else willing to fight. She knows she needs to beat the Romans before they get any closer to home. She makes a stand with her forces. The Romans try to fake her out again, but Zenobia isn't falling for that trick more than once. And suddenly, it looks as if the Palmyrenes might actually prevail this time. But then their lines start buckling, folding in as the legions beat against them, advance after merciless advance. We can imagine Zenobia watching from some sand-crusted rampart as most of her army is slaughtered. There's nothing left to do but retreat to Palmyra. Aurelian follows her there, parking outside the city and starting a blockade to starve them out. It's a rich city, and in his eyes a Roman city, that he doesn't want to sack. 
At first, Zenobia thinks her archers and cavalry might be able to repel them, or the harsh conditions drive them away. As historian Edward Gibbon paints it, She retired within the walls of her capital, made every preparation for a vigorous resistance, and declared, with the intrepidity of a heroine, that the last moment of her reign and of her life should be the same. She thinks that the Persians might come to her rescue, and all she has to do is wait it out. But soon it's clear that she's on her own and Aurelian's not going anywhere. We don't know if Zenobia tries to broker an agreement with Aurelian or if letters ever pass between their camps. The Historia Augusta gives us some, but it's likely that they're a fiction. Even so, I like the flavor of this one Zenobia supposedly sends. You demand my surrender as though you were not aware that Cleopatra preferred to die a queen rather than remain alive, however high her rank. Tough talk aside, things are growing dire in Palmyra. Zenobia is forced to confront the fact that there's no way she can win. Rumor has it that she tries to flee the city by camel, specifically by female camel, as, fun fact, they're faster than male ones. She heads towards the Euphrates River, but the Historia Augusta says she's captured before she can cross. Her city is forced to surrender, and she and her son are put on trial for what are now being called their crimes. It's said she breaks down, blaming the whole mess on bad advice from her inner circle. Some of those advisors are put to the sword. But she can't talk her way out of this disaster. Zenobia, in chains before the Emperor, must know that she's lost the ultimate game. What happens next depends on who you listen to. Zosimus tells us that she and her son drown in the Bosphorus during their transport back to Rome. But he also says that Zenobia is acquitted and allowed to live out her days in Rome as some man's matrona. Though I have trouble imagining her kicking back in some villa and deciding she's had enough of power and freedom. The Historia Augusta, with classic drama, tells us that Aurelian takes her back to Rome and does what Octavian longed to do to Cleopatra parades her through the streets in golden chains, and then has her beheaded. But others say she's pardoned and is given a villa. Zonaris also has her marrying a Roman husband, with Aurelian marrying one of her daughters. Is it just me, or does this sound like Western writers wanting to posthumously tame a woman they find dangerous? Other Arab sources say she commits suicide rather than endure such humiliation. Al-Tabari doesn't mention the Romans at all and has her on a totally different adventure, in which she murders a tribal chief on their wedding night, his nephew chases her, and she flees on her trusty lady camel. When she can't get away, she either kills herself or is executed. Her true end is lost to the shifting sands of time. There's a wonderful statue of Zenobia, carved in 1859, that shows her in those golden chains. It was carved by a woman named Harriet Hosmer. How fitting that some male sculptors at the time thought no woman could ever have carved such a colossal wonder. But she did, and in doing so, gave Zenobia a gaze that's hard to look away from. I have tried to make her too proud to exhibit passion or emotion of any kind, Hosmer said. Not subdued, though a prisoner, but calm, grand, and strong within herself. She gives us a strong and unconquered Zenobia. A woman who could never look down in shame at wanting to rule, and rule well. If you were to time travel back to April 2019 and tell me that season 2 would go on for this long, I never would have believed you. But you know what? I'm not sorry. There was so much to explore in the ancient world. We've walked through more than three civilizations, discovering the lives of everyday women, enterprising wives, and lofty queens. I hope you've enjoyed our frolic through these long ago times as much as I have. But now we're going to move on to a new time and place. Which time and place? For now, I think I'll leave you wondering. Season 3 will begin in a few months' time. You might even see some surprise bonus episodes popping up between now and then. But if you find yourself missing the Explorests, I'll be publishing fresh bonus episodes over on Patreon between seasons, along with sneak peeks of what's coming up next. 
Thanks, as always, for traveling with me. Until next time. Thanks for listening. If you like the Explorers, tell a friend about it. Leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen, or share it on social media. It all really helps the show reach new listeners. You can become a patron or buy a piece of merchandise over at my Etsy shop. You know that list of Roman emperors by Pamela Toller I mentioned? She and I designed a rocking poster of Rome's emperors, as well as the women who supported and opposed them. You'll also find some original artwork of Boudica and Zenobia that I'm quite partial to, and you can get as art prints or on greeting cards. For a transcript, a list of my sources, images, and more, check out the show notes at my website, theexplorespodcast.com. Come find me on Instagram and Facebook at the Explores Podcast and Twitter at the Explores Pod. Thanks as always to Mr. Explores, aka Paul Gablonski, for my theme music logo and his audio editing wizardry, and to the following legends for their vocal stylings: Leanne Rivers as Boudica, Jim DiBartolo as Cassius Dio, Sean Ennis as Tacitus. John Armstrong as Nero, Caligula, and Aurelian, Jordan as Caraticus and Edward Gibbon, and Veronica Washington Ramos as Zenobia. Thank you to the huge list of wonderful people who gave their voices to the Explorers season two. I'm forever grateful. 